The following interview was conducted with David Peretz for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, May the 8th, 2007, uh, at, in the TV studio in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Welcome, and thank Tell you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early life and parents and siblings. Uh, no siblings. That's the easy part. I'm an only child. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people would say, is that hard to tell? Um, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois, on a small farm, but my dad had a retail business store in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, he uh, was uh, first-born Austrian descent, uh, came over in uh, about 1905 from Austria, and uh, my mother was, he was Austrian, my mother was Irish. Uh, they married in later life for the first time for each, and so uh, by the time I came along, uh, they were almost of grandparent age. And uh, somehow I developed this, I guess, older generation maturity. Uh, I always worked on the farm with my mother and uncle. Uh, so work, in the truest sense, probably became just kind of part of my life. And uh, went to a small high sc grade school. Uh, there were six in my grade school class. Uh, there was 49 in my high school class. Went to University of Illinois. Uh, was a successful student. Stayed on. Got a master's and Ph.D. Uh, interviewed uh, a couple of places uh, in the early 70s. Jobs were hard to come by because uh, the federal government had a freeze on job hiring at that time. Uh, and I was fortunate enough that Purdue had an opening that was of my interest uh, in the beef cattle forage extension area. Uh, it was an interest of mine and it was something they were trying to fill. And uh, we happened to niche and they made me an offer in the fall of 71 and uh, I came in July of 72 and I've had 35 wonderful years here ever since. Very good. Tell us a little bit about how did you happen to, what was campus like uh, when you went there to school? Were you involved in any activities and any professors that you recall made an impact on you or kept in touch with? University of Illinois uh, was a totally different campus uh, than I'd say Purdue. Uh, you had the urban Chicago influence. Uh, my wife and I said when we came to Purdue it was 10 years behind in the mindset uh, compared to the University of Illinois in terms of we'd had lots of demonstrations. We'd had National Guard on campus during several demonstrations. Uh, we'd had several, uh, I'll say, disastrous uh, uprisings of lots of smashed windows and beat up cars and things like that, uh, which wasn't the case here at Purdue. Uh, yes, you had some uprisings mm -hmm. and tumultuous times in the late eight, 60s, but at the same token, there was a much greater sharp edge on them at the uh, University of Illinois. We also had minority students rioted once. Uh, it was just a different mindset at the University of Illinois. Uh, in terms of professors, I was very close to several in the Ag Economics Department. Uh, I still maintain correspondence with my major professor. Um, and uh, there were some in, Ag Economic, er, in uh, Animal Science, uh, one of whom just passed away shortly out in Colorado, uh, some others who were in Ag Engineering. Uh, I suppose deep in my heart, and I still have a degree of loyalty at the University of Illinois. I spent nine years there, gained uh, a lot of views on life at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't take it away from me. Uh, mm, and it's some place that at times in my career I thought, well, if there's ever a chance I'd go back, but Purdue's been a great place, and so I've looked at those, but I've usually turned them down and stayed here. Yeah. Uh, but it was a totally different campus, uh, and they were going through a lot of the changes, uh, building new cultural centers, uh, had an underground library, uh, was bringing a medical school in, and things of that nature just as I was leaving. Mm -hmm. So again, it was another kind of comparison of being five to ten years ahead of what I saw at Purdue when I came here in the summer of 72. Mm -hmm. Did you meet your wife there at, in Illinois? No, uh, my wife and I had known each other earlier than that uh, through neighbors on farms uh, and uh, it was just kind of a coincidence and so uh, she and I uh, actually were I think our first time together as a date if you'd call it that uh, was New Year's Eve of 1963 
and uh, we got married in 68. We were with another couple on New Year's Eve of 63, and the other couple married a couple years later, and we've all been friends ever since. So nice. um, we've been together a long time and have uh, two wonderful children as products of our marriage. Do they, where do your children reside? Did they come to Purdue? Uh, my daughter or? is uh, in South Bend, uh, married with uh, our grandson, Nathan. Uh, both she and her husband, Ron, are employed in South Bend. My son, uh, graduated, well, both children graduated from Purdue. My son graduated from Cranert, and he works for a consulting company in Chicago. Good, very good. Okay. The, um, any traditions or that you recall at Illinois that kind of stick in your mind? And we talk about traditions at Purdue, and uh, were there any that, I know one of them, the Indian, is gone. I was just going to say, the one That's mixed been there emotions. a long time. Mixed emotions, mm -hmm. I will say that. Chief Illini Wick was a tradition. A good friend of mine was uh, Chief Illini Wick in the fall of 66. Uh, uh, I relate to that, and yet I also can understand, you know, maybe there's emotions about it. There's a need to reassess things in today's age compared to what we had in the 60s and back when the Indian started many years earlier sure. than that. Right. Uh, we have had traditions here at Purdue. Uh, I mean, we all remember uh, uh, the run around uh, Cary Quad on the coldest night of the year. Uh, that stopped. Uh, times have changed and we need to adapt to it. Some of these traditions probably just aren't the wisest things that public institutions or private institutions ought to continue. Mm -hmm. One of the other ones that every once in a while is the the cords, the senior cords yep. that the uh, people used to wear. In fact, I was at a game a couple of years ago and I saw this man across from me and he said, yes, I can still fit into them. Yeah. <laughs> There's, you know, and this is one of the things I saw, and I guess I will say this about Purdue compared to Illinois. You mm -hmm. know, when you asked your question, the only tradition that came to mind at Illinois was Chief Illini Wick. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were many more. and. There's probably, I'm sure, a line I graduates who would point out many to me. Uh, things at Illinois were more the buildings, uh, the moral plots, uh, the union, uh, just a lot of things at Illinois that were part of. But when you came to Purdue, I found a very traditional, very conservative, very um, I'll say tradition-bound campus who not only maintained tradition but celebrated them, uplifted them. Uh, whether it was uh, the Boilermaker special, whether it was Purdue Pete, whether it was uh, Saturday football games, there was a different mindset here. It was an older campus. It was a campus you could hearken back to and say, this is what Illinois was like when I went there in the fall of 63. and. Uh, Maybe I'm conservative too, but I kind of appreciated that. Yeah, that's nice. That's interesting. And of course, because the Lion Fountain yeah. all these years, and they finally brought that back. So yeah. there are a lot of. When, as I said, we've celebrated tradition, just like uh, the Union and uh, right. the cleanliness of the Union. Uh, the, U the Union at Illinois has never maintained that. They have. Uh, torn the building apart, and if there was any traditional part of it, I guess the pillars are still on the front side, but that's about it. And everything else is <laughs> gone and been redone. <laughs> Not that I've agreed with any of it either. <laughs> okay, now now the career path, so you came from, after your graduate work, you came to Purdue. And tell us a little bit about your experiences in agricultural economics. Um, here. It was a learning area. experience. You mentioned the name before we started running the tape, J. Carroll Bottom. I had the good fortune of coming to the department when several people, J. Carroll Bottom, Noah Hadley, uh, John B. Heavy Kohlmeyer, uh, several people who had retired that were part of the rich history of that department in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s had retired but active, were still active in the department, Lowell Hardin, Earl Butts all came to the department on a regular basis. All were more than willing to uh, mentor as well as scold a new assistant professor when he or she didn't do the right thing. And now I said, and she, uh, when I came, there was one woman in the department, Jan Armstrong, which we shared with that then home economics, now consumer and family science. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a couple of more joined the department about 1975, but uh, female faculty 
by and large, were very scarce. Uh, it was pretty much of a men's club, and uh, probably at times uh, it was a men's club. And I have said several times since that I've been in upper administration. Uh, there were things happened in the 70s that probably would not have been tolerated or let pass by in today's age. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've been here long enough to know the much celebrated fish fry. Um, probably it's good we changed all of that. But anyway, the Ag Econ Department was an opportunity to grow. Uh, Charlie French was a department head for a couple of years and replaced with Paul Ferris, a very kind man. Uh, they too let a new assistant professor uh, with some guidance uh, achieve his or her own opportunities to uh, prove him or herself, uh, and I appreciated that. Uh, they gave us a chance to do it our way. Uh, at that time, extension specialists on campus very much were out in the field. Uh, by 1978, uh, I was on the road nine straight weeks, Monday through Friday, left Sunday night or Monday morning, came back Friday night. Uh, Sixteen weeks I was on the road for most of the time. Uh, we cannot afford to have faculty off campus that much now. Uh, instead, we use technology. Uh, we train educators to be our people out there for us, uh, plus the extension specialist role is now diluted by teaching and research. Uh, back then I was hired as a full-time extension specialist. Nowadays uh, you're hired as a faculty member uh, and you're expected to discover and learn and uh, engage uh, as part of your mission mm -hmm. of Purdue University. For our researchers, uh, explain, elaborate a little bit on that, that you were more, you were hired as a faculty, was more extension specialist, was that kind of a combination? Um, to clarify, so I, okay, were... I was hired um, as a farm management extension specialist uh, with responsibilities in the area of beef cattle, sheep, and forages. And the research that I did would be what we would call very applied research to support the knowledge, new knowledge in my extension program. Uh, I was not hired as a, a basic researcher or somebody who was given a research budget or a research uh, challenge responsibility and said you have to do this big amount of research unlike what we basically everybody who comes to Purdue now as a faculty member has to have pretty much be a breakthrough researcher uh, who probably does re uh, teaching work either graduate or undergraduate uh, and probably has a responsibility of engaging uh, the public or businesses of sharing their newfound knowledge with whoever will better the economy or community. Uh, when I was hired, my job was to take my knowledge, uh, plus what knowledge I gained, and go out and work with farmers uh, primarily and uh, be out there with them. Mm -hmm. So there's a vast difference from, from what? that time. And those times changed in the early 80s. Uh, our first big budget crisis for extension and research was in the early 80s. Bernie Liska was the dean of ag at that time, and Bernie said, this has got to change. And there was a lot fewer people, and uh, there was a lot fewer of us on the road, and we had to pick and choose our travels much more carefully because not only of time, but also money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. You also did some of the farm. Oh, when you, were you an advisor when you were an ag econ into any student organization? Tell us about interaction with the students. Was there... I did. Um, actually, even though I had an extension specialist appointment, uh, no teaching appointment, I uh, took on a senior seminar class uh, that I off and on helped with a semester at a time in Ag Econ. I was advisor to the Ag Economics Clubs. Uh, you begin to learn that there were students, uh, individual students, uh, who very much were natural leaders and would pick up an organization and uh, stay back and stay out of the way and try to help them not drive off the road. And there were some that left their own devices, were perfectly happy to sit and see what their academic advisor would do. Uh, I think that was the last year I advised, too, because I just decided, you know, uh, it's their organization and uh, I'm not going to do it for them. And so that was probably early, mid-80s. And then uh, I was also involved for several years as a faculty fellow at Windsor Hall. Uh, I enjoyed that. My family enjoyed it, of going to eat, of uh, working with the young women in Windsor and getting acquainted with them and kind of, oh, at times being a father figure, at times being a faculty member, at times taking 
uh, my children over and they had a chance to, uh, you know, babysit and uh, deal with uh, a child, a uh, sibling they'd left back home. Oh, good. That was a good, I'm a black fellow over at uh, Tarkington have been for a number of years and I enjoy it very much. My difficulty at the time and the reason I gave it up was I was getting busier and busier mm -hmm. in the administration and to take part in the activities and do it well, uh, something had to give and uh, the time I was in town I felt like I needed to be spending time home with uh, sure. teenage children and so uh, I gave up to faculty fellow, uh, but it's probably, I know Fred Hubdy brought that to Purdue mm -hmm. from uh, his experience in England. Uh, I think it's one of the best things that Purdue has ever done is providing that bridge to the students in a real person basis. Right, and it, it, there's not many many campuses that have that, and no. it's been ongoing for a long That's period right. of time. Right. Um, talk a little bit about that. Uh, I mentioned about the FinPAC, that Cooperative Service Family and Research. Uh, what that brought about by the drought? The well, 88. well, let me yeah. go back a little farther than the drought of '88. Um, Coming through the 70s was, I'll say, the grand period of agriculture. Uh, Earl Butts was the Secretary of Agriculture. He had uh, worked a wheat deal with Russia. Uh, all of a sudden we went from these huge warehouses full of particularly wheat and grain, sold it to the Russians. Uh, there was mixed emotions about that, but all of a sudden prices started going up. Uh, land prices went up. Uh, interest rates were low. Inflation was high. Uh, and everybody said, hey, this is the new era of agriculture. Things are only going to get bigger, better, quicker, higher. Uh, Ronald Reagan became president and said, we can't sustain a double-digit inflation rate. Uh, things are going to have to stop. Uh, as one of my colleagues in Ag Econ described then, he slammed on the brake and farmers hit the windshield. Uh, land prices collapsed, green prices collapsed. Uh, a financial technical term is leverage, where you borrow a lot of money and put a little bit of your own with it. That works well as long as the lever is working the right way. When it goes against you, you very quickly lose all your money and the bankers want theirs back. Starting in about 83, 84 is when that really crashed. And at that time, farm families many of them very solid hard-working farm families did not have an unbiased means of assessing what their future was or even what their current financial situation was. We started a program called the farm program and uh, I failed to look up what that meant before I walked over here. Family Agricultural Resource Management I think mm -hmm. is what it stands mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. F-A-R-M. Yeah. We worked with the University of Minnesota who had developed a computerized program and uh, we spent the money and bought 35 luggable computers. And when I say luggable, uh, you and I think of a laptop today. Uh, these were about a tenth of the power of a laptop and weighed about 40 pounds. And uh, we got those computers, trained extension field staff on how to use them set up an 800 number, promoted it widely, and said to any farm family, we're here, uh, we'll assign you somebody to sit down with you at your kitchen table to work through just where your family situation is, what are some of the options of moving ahead in the future. Farmers were pleased by the opportunity. They were more pleased by the fact that we would say, you can get an extension educator from another county because farmers quickly started watching the parking lot at the extension offices to see whose pickup trucks were there and say, oh, Joe's there, he must be having financial trouble. So farmers did not want to come to the extension office. So we not, and then other farmers would say, I don't want my local extension agent helping me. I'm on his extension board. He thinks I'm a rock solid farmer and I'm struggling. Can you get me somebody from another county? So we were running this kind of a shadow business back and forth across county lines and... Uh, what was the role of the computer that did you... Because they, they didn't have computers in their home, I mean, no. did they... We brought the computer to their house, plugged oh, it in. We okay. had you the computer there it. with this FinPAC program that we bought from the University of Minnesota and were trained on it. And so much like today that 
any farm family or any family, whether farm or business sure. or, you know, suburbia mom and dad, where you keep your checkbook and QuickBooks and everything else, in 1984 and 5, computers were still these things oh, yeah. in the basement of Stewart Center or over in Edad someplace, and, you know, they took up rooms. And then IBM came out with a desktop that, as I recall, had 64K of memory or something. And, uh, but those were hard to move. So we bought these Zenith luggables, and we could take the computer to the farm family. You met with them in their home? In most cases, in their home. Plugged the computer in, um, had a printer, went with it. And, or we'd go to the office and print the materials out and drive it back to them. The educators were amused by two things. Farm families were desperate for help, so it was a crisis. The computer bought them instant credibility because the farmer said, I've never seen one of these before. I've only heard about a computer. My God, you're going to sit here and do this for me right here and now? Uh, so it was the degree of our technology was a little better at that time than what most farm families had or had access to. Sure. So you had technology, you had somebody who was trained to use the software package, FinPAC, and to interpret the results. So 80s was this crisis for agriculture, but it was time for us to work with farm families to help them through a lot of things. We wound up working with bankers, lenders, uh, churches, we had a lot of suicides, we had a lot of banks, uh, officers were struggling. Uh, if you looked at other states, uh, we had some tragedies in banks where uh, individuals would go in and threaten the bankers, sometimes uh, went beyond the threat. Um, it just was a very harsh time in American agriculture uh, and it blunted a lot of people's enthusiasm for the future of farming. Mm -hmm. uh, it also caused a major change. Many farmers decided, if I'm going to survive in farming, i got to find an off-farm job. And they did. Well, we were, up to that point, dependent on farmers to come to meetings during the day or in the evening to hear the latest knowledge from Purdue. Well, if you got a job and you're working in town and you're taking care of your cows or chickens or pigs or corn at night, you can't do either. And so we very quickly found by the late 80s and early 90s, farmers did not come to extension meetings like they used to. Um, so our whole approach to extension was forced to change. Yeah. And uh, to be quite honest, the 90s were a struggling time for us as we tried to, how do we get our knowledge out to farmers? What is the knowledge they really wanted? Uh, I was in an extension administration at that time. and. Uh, those are questions we struggled with. And, uh, we watched all the states struggle trying to figure out. And, you know, we'd look at each other and they'd say, oh, well, that's what they're doing. We ought to look at that. And, well, mm -hmm. we'd bring it home and look at it. And, well, no, that won't work for us either. Backing a little bit for the researchers, I'm thinking of, but prior to this, the extension, the people would go, they had the agents in the communities and they dealt with them. Is that yes. pretty much what it was? And then yep. how was the tie in with, with Purdue? Uh, we were all part Just of the same it, team. We okay. were all on the same team, and the specialists here on campus, uh, the extension faculty, uh, backstopped the educators, uh, gave them knowledge, trained them, uh, went out and did meetings for them. Uh, then, uh, even in the, in the 80s, uh, it was still that kind of a relationship mm -hmm. between campus and field. And we still, in Purdue, have that same relationship today. Other states have gone to different relationships between our campus and field extension staff. Uh, but Purdue has maintained a traditional structure it's always had. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you mentioned earlier in one of your questions, and I skipped over, is the drought of 88. Mm -hmm. um, we were just beginning to get the feed under, the financial feed under Indiana agriculture, uh, 87, things were beginning to look better. 88, uh, it just turned dry. Uh, in May, farmers were planting. It didn't rain, it didn't rain. I'll say early June, uh, it became apparent things, this was not going to be a normal growing year. Uh, as a matter of fact, it could well be a disaster. Um, well, what do you tell farmers in a drought year? 
we can't make it rain. You can't tell them, well, it's not going to rain. Tough luck. Uh, that's kind of what it was, but that wasn't the answer they were looking for. We quickly found that they were looking for solutions of, are there alternative crops I can plant? Uh, are there other things I can do? Then the government program, uh, a disaster bailout program came along in early July. Uh, far more complicated than it needed to be. Farmers wanted to know, what do I have to do to qualify? What do I have to major? What do I have to report? Where do I go? We set up a, a basically a phone pool over in a 661 Cranert, and we maintained that all summer with people uh, rotating in and out of the departments from each of the ag departments as well as CFS. Uh, I actually had a uh, faculty member from uh, psychology would come by once or twice a day kind of not only assessing how we were doing uh, yeah, but also saying have you talked to somebody who maybe I need to call or I need to direct to some local counseling and some help. Uh, farmers were very despondent. Um, I mean, we made all the national news of NBC and everybody else trucking by, uh, and yet at the end of the day, you said we helped a lot of people, but at the end of the day, we still hadn't made a rain. Even though we did then uh, broke the weather pattern, uh, the last week of June, uh, the summer was a disaster. Uh, crops were ruined, uh, and it was probably one of the worst crop years many farmers remembered from the 1930s. Uh, some farmers went broke. Um, if the previous years of the 80s was a straw that really crippled the camel, 1988 did the farm in. Mm -hmm. So it was just one more of uh, legacy years that changed Indiana agriculture. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the changes, what the family farm is uh, still there's still some, but in your time that you've been here, what changes have you? That you'd like to share with the research as far as the farms are concerned, farming it's in general? Farms today are family farms. Uh, everybody thinks they're corporate farms. They are corporate, but they're still owned by a family. The difference is that when I came, the average Indiana farm size was probably four or five hundred acres. Uh, today, uh, the average is something larger, but it's very bimodal. You have a lot of small farms, uh, you got some in the middle, and you have some very large farms. Uh, farming has become a business. Uh, farmers, uh, people in Ag Econ talked about in the 90s, farming is going to become a business. You're going to have to be a business man or a business woman. Mm -hmm. You're going to understand international trade. You're going to understand marketing principles. Probably the good thing was that we transferred that knowledge, that passion, that mindset in our classrooms in the 90s. So the f graduates of Purdue Agriculture who went back farming or went into agribusiness in the 90s uh, understood that and really went out here and took a different tact on farming. Um, so you see a farmer today who is farming thousands of acres, uh, is as modern of a businessman as somebody who is running a factory or another business across town. Uh, can manage his or her finances and marketing and technology the same way. Um, I took President Jiski to a farm about a year ago and they had a brand new John Deere soybean planter there. And I happened to have John Harden Jr., trustee, along on the visit that day. And John took the president over there and said, let me show you something. And John opened up a panel on the back of the planter and showed him all the micro switches and the processors and circuit boards in this planter. And the president, you know, was used to circuit boards and technology and rockets and cars, but well, I didn't think agriculture depended that much on technology. Well, we do. Yeah. Uh, farming is big. It's a business. It utilizes technology, and it's real time around the world. Uh, we have farmers now who have no hesitancy at all in farming in Brazil or dealing with farmers, their fellow farmers in China or Vietnam or India. Uh, farmers are entrepreneurs that's today. Quite that's a, quite that's, a that's the change. biggest difference, I think, is the whole the farming industry itself. It's an industry itself. Right. Thank you. Yeah. 
One of the things that I was reading and doing some research, the Agriculture Weather Station closed in 95. Uh, well, so, well, there seemed to be that some problems with that uh, that they when it was closed. It was fine. It was a federal weather oh. service decision. It was funding. Mm -hmm. um, like many other things, uh, you could have an automated automated machine doing part of the recording work, so you didn't need as many stations. Uh, and so they uh, basically, uh, what should I say, uh, reduced their numbers of field stations down to few less. Uh, that was a loss for Purdue for a while. We missed the data. Uh, and it's taken us a while to figure out how to get it back. We have our own automatic measuring devices. Uh, the agronomy department has been rebuilding the staffing within the department, not the Federal uh, Ag sure. Meteorological Service or Weather Service, but they have now a state climatologist, uh, and he is a very popular fellow. Uh, people ask him a lot of questions about, is this May as warm or cold as it is? Is that normal? <laughs> and so, you know, it's one of the things that government just said we got to cut costs someplace and did. Yeah. One of the things, too, that's come in the last years is that the Farm Progress Show, uh, I remember when it was just down 52 or further down, they had the signs, mm -hmm. and that's it really caught on. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, the first one was about uh, 1995. Well, um, first Farm Progress show that I grew up with as a child in Northern Illinois was in the mid-1950s. Uh, I was involved in the 1973 Farm Progress show when it was here in Indiana. I was involved in nearly all of them. Uh, through to the one in uh, 2001 that you remember out here south of town. Um, let's see, I'm trying to do my math here in my head. I've got to make sure 2001 is the year we're talking about. Uh, 2003, um, that's right, 2001 was, I'll say, also probably the high point. Uh, it was handy for Purdue to have a very major presence. Right. Uh, in 98, 95, we had a major presence at Windfall over in Tipton County and down in uh, Vigo County in 1995. Mm -hmm. uh, the most complicated one was in 92 when I was at Columbus because then Vice President Quayle came for a visit and I spent my entire Farm Progress Show week dealing with Secret Service. Um, there are a lot of stories going around about my dealings with the Secret Service that probably <laughs> won't add one bit to this. Uh, and you could share just a mini one. That they were there. Who was there? I forgot that Dan was did go to that he one. He did come to the show, and uh, the Secret Service did their usual due diligence. Uh, they. How long did he stay? A couple days. He stayed. No, he stayed about two hours, and it took us a week to put it together. Uh, <laughs> They didn't understand agriculture. They didn't understand what we were doing. They understood one thing. The president was to be safe, and or the vice president was to be safe and sound, and they were to be in complete control of every aspect of his visit. Um, sort of reminds you, doesn't look at when Reagan came and they sealed down the manhole covers and did all the things. Oh, we the did camp. things like that at Farm Progress Show. The one which is a true story. Um, the day we, they basically, at that time, Farm Progress Show said he cannot come on to the Farm Progress Show tent city. Well, we had, at that time, a major antique machine show just next to tent city, and we had bleachers. And they thought, that's the perfect host for the vice president. He's off the ground. We met that requirement. They have bleachers, and Purdue will do what they're told. So uh, this whole circus started the week before, and uh, it just continued to grow as the week went by uh, with uh, a very fine gentleman from uh, Columbus area pointing his finger in my chest and said, if you don't do it our way, uh, I've got uh, Steve Beering's phone number and I will call him. And uh, so I figured out how I could say yes and still maintain a degree of dignity. But the one story I was going to share was 
they had this whole strategy plotted out for Thursday morning of how the vice president would be in this tent by himself and he was going to call the White House for something and then he'd come out of the tent and was walking through our plots and he would see one of our agronomists out working in the plots and being the you know, nice guy that the vice president was, he would walk over and shake hands and the agronomist would be showing him a corn plant. Well, this was all fine. Just keep in mind that there's Secret Service and county and city and state police everywhere. Plus, they'd put uh, a couple of their um, snipers up in a cherry picker fire truck above us so they could keep track of everything going on. So everything is going according to script, except when the pres vice president walks out of the tent and I look ahead to where he was walking to the cornfield, there is not one Purdue specialist, there are two. And the second one wasn't in the script. And I'm standing there watching this unfold and this voice in my ear says, tell me you know who the other one is. And I have told that individual who retired a couple ago, I said, there for an instant, what happened next to you was entirely whether I said yes or no. Because <laughs> I knew if I said no, something was going to happen. And I said, yes, unfortunately, I know him. And, you know, we got through that. Well, needless to say, the Secret Service was not amused by our creativity at the last minute. <laughs> So, you know, we had lots of stories at the Farm Progress Show. Yeah, good. They're still, now they have a permanent site, don't they? Yes, they do. And uh, part of that story now is, Catherine, that Purdue will not be part of the Farm Progress Show. We made a decision this past winter of uh, oh, early 07. Farm Progress Show is not a permanent site at Decatur, Illinois. Uh, it's about 140 miles, 150 miles. Uh, for us to have a presence there that I deem worthy of Purdue. It was just simply going to be too expensive. Yeah. There wasn't that many Indiana citizens there to say, wow, I'm glad Purdue is here. Uh, we made a decision not to go. We have a minor role in Farm Science Review uh, that's uh, provided by Ohio State University. Uh, it's about the same distance, but uh, we get by with about 10 people, mm -hmm. three or four displays. Uh, we collaborate with them on the displays and the projects and the, the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the land-grant mission of let's work together, and so we are probably going to do that. We've had other companies come to us and have raised the question of, well, would Purdue be interested in co-oping on a farm show here in Indiana in the future? And we've said, yeah, we'd be willing to talk about it. Sure. So the Farm Progress Show is now kind of part of that rich history and legacy of not only Purdue, but my years at Purdue. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now we come to 1999, and you are the director of the Cooperative Extension Service. And your first priority will be to ensure that extensions to first clientele continues to be well served. Our job is to help Hoosiers take charge of their future, and you certainly shared some of that. You replaced Han Hank Wadsworth. Hank Wadsworth, a dear friend. Uh, yeah. Hank so Wadsworth. tell us a little bit about some of the challenges and a little bit about outreach. Let me just add one personal story. Okay. Uh, I told you Please I do. was interviewed in September of 1971 and was offered a job. And Hank Wadsworth was the assistant head for extension in 1971. So Hank and I go back a long time. He went to Cornell and Oregon State in the meantime. I stayed at Purdue. So uh, following him in 1999 after having worked under him for 10 years as assistant director was kind of you know, kind of hey, nice. you can't get much better than this. Okay. The challenges I faced in 1999 were several. They they go back to what we faced in the 90s. How do we get real-time information to the citizens of Indiana? And extension really had to reach beyond farm families because there wasn't as many true farm families, but there were communities that were struggling, community development. There were families and youth. 4-H uh, wasn't just for kids on the farm. 4-H is part of a youth development experience that could take place in Indianapolis or Richmond or Muncie. Um, everything was changing so fast. Uh, staffing was changing, and we really thought we were doing really well. We had gotten a $2.8 million increase in our state line item from uh, the General Assembly in the spring of 99, and we felt very comfortable with ourselves. And uh, mm -hmm. 
At the time the state of Indiana faced a budget crisis in March of 2002, they cut the budget by 7%. We stopped hiring. Uh, we sat with open positions in May of 2003. We had 40 open positions, which was one seventh of our field staff. Uh, one in seven positions was open. Everybody was kind of doing double duty. Finally, in May of 2003, we started hiring. Uh, now, four years later, we have hired 100 new educators. Uh, one third of, or over one third of our staff have been hired in the last four years, uh, most of them young people who bring a rich uh, enthusiasm, uh, knowledge base, as well as a passion for helping others. We have had to harness technology. We've had to recognize that now farmers don't ask us not only about how do I grow more corn on the same acres, but so what do I do with the corn to make more money after I've harvested it? Uh, what's the value added? What can I start for a new business? Uh, can my wife make any money making cheese or bread or jam or selling it to farmer's market? Uh, what can we do? You know, there was a time where most communities said, yeah, we have a halfway interest in industrial parks, but we didn't mean it. Uh, communities in the early 2000s realized Unless we have off-farm jobs, farmers aren't going to survive either. So we had communities really thinking about how do we develop, how do we grow our economies. Uh, at the local level. At the local level. Um, I was fortunate to have a president of Purdue show up saying, Purdue will be the economic engine of Indiana. Uh, he quickly discovered that extension was a way to reach out to local communities and help local community leaders, economic leaders, get knowledge to them, help them see their options. And uh, I think the other thing was Martin Jiske, with a sheer passion about all of this, said, believe me, we can do it. And they did. And uh, all of a sudden it became, you know, it was a lot of work. It was fast paced. But a lot of communities said, Purdue is the economic engine. Okay. Where were your, are your new people coming? Okay. Okay. Uh, I would start leave with that. Where, where are the new people? All, all, when we get They're all the over tape. the state. Um, see, we have still have staff in where every county. Until we get on the tape, and yeah. about well, that's where I'll start off. I don't even know what time it is. Uh, almost three o'clock. Okay. Well, that's not bad. Oh. He keeps on time. We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to switch the tape. These, this is an hour tape, so we you know, need to... I'll switch the tape out. Yeah, okay. Or we can do it again, or that's yeah. up to you. Um, I was started to ask you, where you, you've increased your the extension staff. Where are they coming from? Do they come from all over the state? Are there younger people coming out of college, or what's the mix? Our in requirement the for extension educators in the field are people with master's degrees. Uh, we require all to have a master's degree, and so many are Purdue graduates, uh, but we have graduates from surrounding states, uh, Indiana State, Ball State, um, Kentucky, Illinois, Michigan State, Ohio State. Uh, we have people coming to us from a lot of places. Is there competition among the states, do you think, or do... Uh, yes. There is um, and yet, there is not a lot of traffic among state extension systems. I mean, you know, I have one or two pack up and go to Michigan or Ohio State just because it's a better opportunity. Or I may have somebody come here that says this is a better there's opportunity. There's not that much. No. Okay. Um, I think there's also a feeling amongst the extension directors of simply not raiding each other because it doesn't do anybody any good. Um, you know, why do that? Uh, the academic departments obviously are pretty competitive. Cutthroat is another word, but uh, departments are pretty careful about, or the extension system is pretty careful mm -hmm. about not stealing each other's help. What's the longevity? Do they stay quite a long period of time? And do some of them, they live in the communities? Many oh of yeah, them most of them okay. we would hope would live in the communities. Part of the strength of Purdue Extension is the fact that our staff live in the communities with the people they work, they serve. So mm -hmm. they get to hear the problems right at the grocery store or at the park or at the PTA meeting or wherever. Uh, problems don't come to them because 
somebody wrote to them or called them. They hear about it on the street or somebody walked in the front door of the extension office. So we have always maintained a very strong exten county extension system and I would hope the next director will feel the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, the other reason with counties putting up so much of the money for uh, the county system, uh, you know, it's kind of obvious the counties believe very strongly in the importance of having uh, people right out there in the county. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, what were some of the, uh, tell us a little about outreach, uh, some of the things you did and brought, bring the internet into people in the We area. started using the internet uh, with some of that money that we received from the General Assembly in 99. We put a T1 line in every extension office to give them a high speed connection. Uh, that was a breakthrough uh, because surrounding states still were using dial-up modems or no connection at all. Uh, some states were trying to use a satellite-based uh, system for education. Uh, we were able to use internet and uh, gave the counties very quick access to the resources of the world, if you will. And then about five years ago, we started using the internet protocol video system, IP video. Uh, and four years ago we seriously invested in that so every office has IP video capabilities of some kind and about 40 locations have room size units so we do a lot of connectivity now of IP video face-to-face -face, real time. And But that's really enhanced it a lot, getting to them. It has enhanced getting to our constituents. Mm -hmm. It's been also a tremendous opportunity for us to save time and money of our staff traveling. Uh, we have now about five to six hundred IP video events a year uh, that save us in excess of a million dollars just in time and travel. Very good. And so that that has been one. Now our difficulty, the next step is going to be is I think the capability will be is families, whoever they are, can tune into a program at their home. So okay, if I don't have to go to the extension office to watch this program, you know, you begin to say, okay, so help me understand the value of that extension educator in the local community. Their value is still going to be localizing the discussion, still being the local source of much like a library. Somebody walk in and says, I'm looking for. Right. Hey, I know just the place to get that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's always going to be the need for a human being behind the counter, behind the desk, at the local community level, the same as there's a need for a local library. All right. And most of your extension people, they're in the community, they spend most of their, they don't move around, so they stay. You need that one-on-one. -on -one. That's right. They deal uh, with them, they're, they're friends, they're peers. When I came to extension years ago, 70s, 80s, even in the early 90s, there was a lot of moving amongst counties. Uh, one of the things was people felt they could better themselves, better their salaries by moving all the time from county to county. Uh, late 90s got into this decade under my leadership. Uh, movement amongst counties has just about stopped. We will have an occasional person move from one county to another. Um, I just had one a couple of weeks ago. Why'd you move? It's 45 minutes closer to my parents. Uh, hey, that's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an opportunity for him to get closer and that's an opportunity to continue to grow. Uh, and we'll have no problem filling the county he left because he had a great program. So people now become pretty much lifelong residents of those communities as part of our extension outreach system. Yeah. And that enhances their credibility and their what, what they're able to do in their contributions. It takes a year to two years for a new extension educator to establish uh, confidence, uh, acceptance, uh, credibility in a local community. Mm -hmm. And this by being there, mm -hmm. and once that's built up, oh, then yeah. they, and they come here for annual meetings, do they come here? We have an annual meeting each October here on campus, three days. Uh, all 270 of them come in and uh, we spend a lot of time on staff development. One of the things that I suppose people would say is one of the marks I've done is I focus a lot on the person when they come in. Uh, when you use IP video, it's rather impersonal. Uh, our young staff is under a lot of stress, they're new. So we spend a lot of time talking about generations of uh, value in yourself, of uh, everything from health to having health fairs to retirement, 
you know, planning for retirement, uh, you name it, we've done it. But it's always more been focused on not a new m program you take home, but rather improving yourself, making yourself a better family member and stuff of that nature. Mm -hmm. Time Maybe. management. Yeah, these are things that you cover then. Backing a little bit on the fish fry, how that's changed over time. The program and the format has changed, hasn't it? Everything has changed. Uh, Including, including, the, including what's served. There's no fish. There's no fish. We changed that when we had the pork crisis here a few years ago and we started serving pork. Uh, prior to that, it was fried fish. Um, with a lot of activity over in the armory. There was a lot of activity. It was raucous. It was raw. <laughs> uh, anybody was up for a joke. Uh, <laughs> Well, I remember when Dr. Hansen was here, there were some, there were pictures and things. That Steve, well, Art Hansen was willing to do just about anything. Um, Steve Beering wasn't Rob. quite as willing to participate as warmly as In Art some of Hansen. the activities, huh? Yeah, and Dr. Beering kind of had an air about him that you probably were not going to ask Dr. Beering to do some of those things. Uh, Art Hansen was simply a good sport about it. I'm not critical of either Steve no, Bering you. or Martin Jiski. Right. Right. Uh, they're totally different personalities. John Hicks was the biggest clown we had. Um, but you know, it was right. glee club, it was band, it was cheerleaders, it was girls, it was raunchy jokes, it was eagles flying over the top of people and bad signs and you know, Nothing was left untouched. I mean, we had just about every bad joke you could think of and was <laughs> proud of it. And Donya Lester here several years ago said, okay, like agriculture, it's become a business. The fish fry ought to be treated as a gathering of the business leaders of agriculture. And you come to fish fry today, you want to put on a suit and tie. Uh, you never used to have speakers either, did you? Or we were, did have oh, did was mostly a comedian. The governor would talk, oh, and maybe see. a state senator, but you usually had not some a featured sort of, speaker like you've been having. Not a then. featured speaker where you know you had somebody come in, uh, where everybody was saying, "Wow, I'm glad I was here today to hear that." Right. Uh, like that, the astronaut you had. Yeah, the astronauts, or you know, the people of a few years ago, and uh, you know, Sunday morning interview host, uh, that was not the speaker we were looking for when we did fish fry of uh, right. 20, 30 years ago. I used to be on the gags committee, so I knew the inside joke on them, and <laughs> I won't blame any guilty parties. <laughs> uh, but why did you have to move it to Indianapolis? Usually it's always been on campus, though. Um, was that a two reasons. Oh. Two reasons. One was size. Uh, it was a limited capacity in the Army. Two, we used to do it on Friday. Uh, parking was a bear. I mean, everybody who came complained. Um, very limited because the garage was oh, yeah, very the small. Garage and was full, and the students were here, and the weather was miserable, and so we moved it to Indy and put it on Saturday. And you uh, were out at University Inn for a couple of times, weren't you? At the University Inn. No, we in went the from the oh. Armory. Uh, we had some other programs out oh, there, I see. but. Uh, we the fish fry moved to the state fair, and it's uh, been a cordial host ever since. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now let's talk about New Lieutenant Governor is the Indiana Commissioner of Agriculture, mm -hmm. and you have contacts. Tell us a little bit about how those contacts are, uh, what they're involved with. Prior to a couple of years ago, the Commissioner of Ag was the Lieutenant Governor, and then there was a Deputy or Assistant Commissioner of Ag who I worked with a lot in my role as Ag Program Leader, some as uh, Extension Director. Um, they were great people. Uh, I enjoyed working with Joe Pearson and uh, David Myers and some of those people. And uh, it was a collegiate relationship. Uh, we worked together to solve farmers' problems and questions and issues and tried to do things together. Um, Department of Ag, there's all good reasons for it, and I have no question that it was needed. Uh, but it also became a little more competitive uh, because the Department of Ag, like you would with any political agency, has to generate its own value in the eyes of the constituents, the voters. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to say, okay, so who gets credit for this? Uh, you know, so we have those discussions a little more today than we used to. Um, 
But I've enjoyed working with governors, lieutenant governors, and the staffers. Uh, I was not one to deal with the uh, members of the General Assembly much. Uh, for 10 years, I was chair of the uh, Pesticide Review Board, a governor's appointed committee to oversee uh, the pesticide section of the Indiana State Chemist. That put me in uh, contact with lots of people. Uh, and we had our contentious votes and contentious discussions about the use of pesticides and the storage of them. And uh, so again, you had a lot of those. We I have many fond memories of working with the Beef Cattle Association from its very beginning in 1973. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of opportunities to work with the leadership of Indiana agriculture, elected. At the state uh, level. Uh, you know, elected in state government, county government, elected in organizations. Mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate yeah, in that case. Good, good combination. The um, agricultural clinic, they used to have those. Is that still going with the, uh, with the Bankers Association? Do they still have those? They still have the Do Bankers they? Clinic. That's been a long time. That has been a long time. Freddie Barnard and the staff in Ag Econ still do that program. It's well attended. It's a different structure. The Ag Clinic of the spring has been combined into the Bankers School in the fall, so it's one event now. Uh, when you started asking the question, I thought you were going to ask me about Farm Science Days, which used to be the same week as Fish Fry. Right. Uh, farm Science Days, as I said earlier, when farmers got off farm jobs and couldn't come to campus for Farm Science Days, you know, it's kind of hard to have a Farm Science Days and no audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went through a few embarrassments and uh, decided, okay, I can quit this too. Uh, fish fry was always the culmination of that week of farm science days. And it used so, to be the the winter. Another thing was winter the winter. Winter short course. Do they still have those? No. Winter short course yeah. stopped uh, in the late 80s. Oh, we okay. tried uh, we tried again in the early 90s. And it, again, young people, you know, when I came here in the 70s was that heyday of agriculture. and. High school graduates wanted six weeks of tell me how to farm, tell me how to grow more corn or raise better hogs, and I want it in six weeks, and I'll come to Purdue, and I'll pay for it, or the banker will give me a scholarship, and I'm going to come home and farm with Dad and do this. Um, those young men didn't have all, uh, women in some cases, didn't have that opportunity in the early 80s as the farm crisis hit. They didn't have the money. Uh, and they very quickly saw this isn't going to work and dad was here first so I better just go directly out of high school and get a job and our enrollment and four-year program dropped the uh, winter short course went away we started it up again in the 90s didn't have an audience and so in today instead the replacements kind of working with Ivy Tech and some of the other two-year colleges to provide uh, ag classes as part of a two-year program with Ivy Tech across the state or Ancilla College uh, where those young people probably aren't ready or don't want to come to Purdue and instead would say I'd rather get a two-year degree here, learn what I need to and stay in the community and be part of agriculture here locally. So the replacement for the short course currently is a much different model. Uh, we're still evaluating, uh, there's still a mystique about uh, the short course. If you go across Indiana and you talk to people, oh yeah, you still have the short course? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, they've, been going do for so long. they've been going for so long. I remember even when I first came here, they, they held it, and people still, I still hear a little bit about it. They were there, or some of the o older people that came with years ago. It was a fun filled six weeks of hard, you know, those guys showed up. It was like the veterans coming back after mm -hmm. World War II. We're going to work hard and we're going to play hard. Right. Uh, those young people came to campus for six weeks and they studied hard and they played hard. All right, and they got a certificate. At they the got end. a certificate, certificate right. uh, and the other thing they did is uh, they recorded the grades in the classes, and if they decided to come back for a f regular coursework on campus, uh, they could actually add some of that to their uh, trans uh, transcript. Or transcript, or yes. Yeah. Did some of them uh, end up uh, enrolling? Yeah, one Purdue? of the most illustrious one was Don Perlberg. Don Perlberg started at Purdue as a short course uh, participant. My goodness. So, it is a small world. It's a small world. It really is. Right. A lot of young people, I'm sure, I picked on Don, but there's other people who came here and sure. said, I can study. I can do college work. And so... And this gave them an opportunity to see whether... This gave them an opportunity they, to try it out. And then they also had some, as you say, that some of those uh, were put on their transcripts, so right. that helped a little. They had a little bit of a leg right. up. You know. How about the um, Top Farmer pro uh, Program, Top Farmer Crops? Is that still going on? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, 
It too has gone through a reinvigoration as uh, agriculture has changed, uh, so has top crop. It is still well attended, held every summer, same as has been. I first became involved when I was a graduate student in Illinois in 1968. And uh, I've been- Keep it going. <laughs> uh, they, it was part of the package when uh, it was in, I was in the department, and it was probably one of the things that brought me to Purdue in 71, the interview, was mm. the, my knowledge of, hey, these guys at Purdue are really good. <laughs> Um, one of the things, that, let's talk a little about your awards. One you got was the Frederick L. Hovey Award. And any others? How did you happen to, uh, that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, and were you surprised? Yes, I was. Yeah. Um, the Fred Hovey Award, the Frederick L. Hovey Award is a award in recognition of somebody's contribution to the betterment of the rural communities of Indiana. And, uh, is somebody that anybody can nominate a Purdue staff member for. And uh, somewhere out here in Indiana is some person who wrote a letter to the selection committee and the selection committee said, you know, Dave has made a real difference. Uh, and that was there in the 80s uh, when we were doing FinPAC and all of that. And uh, I was a lucky recipient that year of the Hubdy Award. Uh, the Hubdy Award is a very prestigious award supported by the Indiana Farm Bureau in the name of Fred Hubdy. Yes, is it a monetary award as well? Uh, a modest one, okay. $800, uh, which in today's age you'd say, well, gee, that's not going to break the bank. But, you know, having your name on that plaque in the hallway of Ag Administration that says, it's kinda neat. that's kind of neat and there's some really great people yeah. up there before me and after me that I'm just kind of humbled by being part of their I company. Any other special awards that you care to comment on? Uh, I received the same year the Charvel Award, uh, which is for Outstanding Extension Specialist, uh, named after uh, Eric Charvel, a plant pathologist who is, uh, was one of those old-time strong personalities of extension uh, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. and. Uh, he was one of those characters that we talked about before we came on the air that shaped Indiana Extension and shaped Purdue University. Uh, I always say the people of that time had to be very strong individuals because they were pioneers in Extension, pioneers of taking knowledge out to farmers. Uh, the story is always told of hybrid seed corn that, you know, hybrid seed corn is going to poison my soil. I don't want that stuff around, you know. Grant, this open pollinated corn was great. Nitrogen fertilizer, oh no, I can't use that. And You know, don't want to use lime. And uh, these pioneers of extension were ones who went out and said, give up these, you know. Tails. Tails that, right. you know, came across the plains in the Conestoga wagon. They just won't work. If you're yeah. going to succeed, you have to use technology. Yeah. Let's see, now retirement is a look ahead. Part of what you do in extension is to look ahead to challenges that are coming and prepare people to deal with those things. That's kind of a nice quote. I like that. I believe in that. Uh -huh. um, a quote, not sure. mine, it's Ralph Nader's, uh, that somebody shared with me a while back is uh, Nader said the role of a leader is to create more leaders, not more followers. Uh, I have tried in my role as director and as assistant director be the keeper of the position. Uh, I never saw myself as kind of the director. Uh, my son uh, has gone with a young woman here on campus for three years and after we got better acquainted with her uh, something was said one day and she says, I don't know, somebody asked her about, you know, what's it like meeting Stephen's parents, and she said, wasn't nearly as scary as meeting the associate dean. I'd never really thought about it till then. <laughs> uh, I have always strived to hire the best people I could find and to challenge them to do the best job they could as they saw fit. Uh, I've never been very good at telling anybody else what to do. Uh, I'll kind of give you a pretty fuzzy framework and say, go for it. Uh, I'll be there to applaud. I'll be there to help. Uh, if you trip, I'll help catch you. Uh, but you need to learn this job. And uh, as I started thinking about retirement, I started putting people through uh, intense conferences and change management. Uh, started preparing people for, you know, taking over, making lists of things that need to be done. 
I do not want to walk out and everybody say, A, I'm glad he's gone, or B, worse yet, I have no idea what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, I've always believed in the mortality that, you know, I might not be here tomorrow, so you better understand how this works. Good, good and uh, in retirement planning, I felt the same way. You all need to know this job well enough that if I don't come back tomorrow, you can keep extension running, which is not a simple business. It's a $50 million budget with 600 people involved in it uh, that deal with thousands and thousands of people on a daily basis. And uh, sometimes we do things wrong and I get a phone call from a politician or uh, somebody who simply says, I don't understand why we can't pray at our extension meeting. Uh, it's because in today's age, we have many different beliefs and values in our community. Not all of them may be Christian. Uh, and we need to be open and welcoming to anybody and everybody. And that's hard for people, particularly in Indiana, which is a very conservative Christian state, to say, I don't understand why I can't do what I want to do. And why can't they do it my way? Mm -hmm. That's probably the legacy problem the next person is going to have to deal with, is helping Indiana people understand the demographics of this state are changing. Martin Jiske has recognized that as we made community visits. Uh, the leadership of Purdue has seen it across departments. Uh, the new president that we got to meet yesterday obviously recognizes it very much that demographics of California changed and she, her college university adapted. Uh, the demographics of Indiana are changing and they will have to adapt. Right. The people of Indiana are changing, extension will have to change again. Right. Any, um, what's your favorite memory of Purdue? That one? There are many. Okay. Um, or an, uh, I usually ask for an outstanding event, you can do both if you'd like to. There have been great times, there's been times where Martin Jiske has stood up the fish fry and I wasn't there, I was on a speaking tour in Florida at the time and I know he always used prepared remarks and uh, I got a phone call about a middle, in the middle of the Saturday afternoon in Florida on the day of fish fry so I just wanted you to know that Martin Jiske spent 10 minutes of today's speech giving unprepared remarks uh, saying good things about you. I'll probably always remember that. Um, Helping young people, uh, having somebody a couple of years ago have me come out to a meeting in their county and this young man said, I want to introduce you to these people. And I thought, okay, fine. And he got up and he told the people, he said, I wouldn't have been here if it hadn't been for Dave Petritz. Uh, it's those things that stick in your mind that says, you know, I did make a difference in some people's lives. Uh, and that's what I guess I probably wanted to be noted for is I made a difference. And if I look at the Fred Hubdies, the Al Stewarts, the people who were the names that created the Purdue we know today back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, they had to make things happen. But I don't think any of them ever forgot that this place ran on people. Yeah. And uh, I haven't forgotten that lesson I learned from them many years ago. Yeah. That this place is all about the success of every person, whether it's the president of the university or it's the person running the camera sitting in the corner or it's the guy out here pushing the broom. Yeah. Uh, every person here at Purdue has a passion about Purdue and if they don't believe in it, we're not going to do the best we can. Right. Anything that uh, you think that I did not ask in, in closing? Any special comments at all? No, we'll probably think of some things and I'll call you or send you an email, but by and large, you've done a remarkable job of researching me and uh, brought back some memories that I probably got a little foggy about uh, over the years. Um, but your recall was very good. Yeah, yeah, because every one of them left a little bit of a mark. Um, That's key. You know, whether it was being on a trustees tour in the May of 1973 with uh, Art Hansen, Guy Wilson, and Tom Graham. Now, 
You Where'd probably you, know the names. Where did you go? Huh? Where did you go? In the we trip? went to southern Indiana. Oh, okay. uh, Purdue didn't have over-the-road buses like we did then, and so we used vans, and I was one of the van drivers. Um, a little bit of politics here. Uh, we, can we still have time, don't we? Yeah. Guy Wilson, Guy Wilson was a very loyal Democrat. And there's pictures of him with Matt Welch and some of the other true Democratic leaders of the state of Indiana. Tom Graham, in his own words, said, I wasn't much of a Republican until I met Guy Wilson. They were both trustees. Tom Graham was an extremely conservative Republican trustee, conservative to the point where he resigned from the board in a fit when Purdue voted to remove hours for women dorms. But, in the May of 1973, Watergate was just getting ahead of steam. And I had the two of them in my van one night, uh, going back from dinner. And I told Tom later, I said, having you two back there was like having two bull walruses in the back of the van, because all you did was kind of beller at each other about <laughs> Watergate. And, you know, it's fun things like that, or, you know, standing in a hall one night in the Union with two people I have the highest of academic regards for, Steve Beering and Bob Ringel. And the two of them got telling stories and giggling like a pair of teenage girls, laughing at each other. You know, that was a sight of them. Uh, right. Working with Steve Beering on a, you know, on a community tours and watching him go from a meeting with kindergarten kids, asking intelligent questions of them, trying to explain what Purdue is, to the next meeting of a multi-billion dollar corporation board of directors where he's sitting around talking about who's your competition and what's the technology you need from Purdue to survive in the next decade. Um, there's not many people can make that transition in conversation and I saw a man who did it with ease and grace. Um, you know, those are the memories that I always keep, have. Right? Um, and those are good ones, and they're really nice. It's wonderful. So, you know, um, Dick Coles, uh, you know, God help the man. Uh, yeah. Dick Coles was a character, uh, as all of us were probably in those times. We could, we could be more ourselves in a different age than you could be now. Am right. I saddened by that? No. Because when we were our characters, it was usually at the expense of somebody or something else, and we shouldn't be that way. Uh, we need to be respectful of whomever, whatever. Uh, you know, I, I used to tell jokes, and I don't anymore, because I figured out that jokes were typically at the expense of somebody else. Hmm. And so that's the way I feel about this job. I'm a public employee. I'm always on duty, uh, and no matter where I am, what I'm doing, this head of white hair, I have been places where I never thought anybody would know me, and somebody will come up and say, you're Dave Petrus from Purdue. <laughs> and thank God they know, right? I was... <laughs> yes, I am, right? Yes, I am. Right, okay. You know, I was sitting in a bar one afternoon in French Quarter in Indianapolis, and Two couples came in and sat next to me, and there was a couple other extension directors, and they got up to leave, and one guy said, you're Dave Petrus from Purdue, and I, yes, I am. And he said, well, I'm so-and-so from Evansville, Indiana. Hmm. Uh, so it's been you're good. always it's been, on duty. Yeah. We thank you very, very much for everything. We've really enjoyed this. It's been I've really enjoyed it. It's been my a memory pleasure. trail. Yes. I really enjoy it. Catherine, Rob, thank you. Thank you. You know. Okay, the um, you know Air Orville Redenbacher used to visit campus, and one I have uh, a story. one I have. day um, 